when U.S. President Joe Biden announced his $2 trillion package to help out the economy, seemed fine, no problem, but there's certainly more to it, and oh, could $2 trillion become $4 trillion? We're going to find out right now as we check in with Jonathan Bidlack. Good morning, Jonathan. Hey, thanks so much for having me. No, thank you. Now, uh, we're sort of in the midst of relocking down Canada as we speak. So could you do our listeners a favor? Because I think a few other things have distracted, uh, distracted us of late. Before we get into this, can you sort of recap what this relief package, or at least how it was initially pitched, and then we'll kind of break it down. You're talking about the, the infrastructure package? Yeah, it's, um, it's you know, look, I mean, like all of these big packages that we've seen recently, it is, uh, it is a hodgepodge of funds for all sorts of stuff. So, uh, you know, the estimate is about $2.3 trillion for everything from, uh, you know, bridge, bridges and roads to, uh, you know, fixes to the electrical grid to expansion of broadband. I mean, you name it, it is it is included in here. And we probably would have to have a have a whole hour to go through all the details. But you know, the the, the challenge with these packages, of course, is that you know there's there's obviously going to be things that are good. There's going to be things that are bad. And then there's the broader question of you know can we afford it given all the other money that we've been spending. And so uh, you know that I think has become sort of the uh, you know a focus anyway of of the ongoing debate in the United States. So just from a, a very conceptual point, in terms of the, the areas that Biden has targeted, what is your assessment of who he's giving support to, maybe who he's leaving out, and, and are there ways he could have done it better? Yeah, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot that's being left out, candidly. I mean, you know, there is there is support in the transportation realm. You know, we've got, a, you know, uh, additional funding for, for Amtrak, of course, and, and all the sort of, you know, different um, – I, I don't know infrastructure interest groups if you want if you want to call it that um, you know it's uh, it's you know it's obviously it's a very expensive package and and the argument that that the Democrats are presenting is that you know look our our infrastructure is old and uh, we need to uh, um, you know fund things that have not been funded for a very long time and I think you know to some degree there's there is uh, there is a point to that I think that the argument that is not as as good of, of one if, if you want to say is, is um, the the other argument that's been put forward for infrastructure is that it's necessary stimulus in the wake of the the COVID pandemic, and I think that you know that argument is is um, doesn't really hold up to scrutiny in quite the same way because uh, first of all you know the U.S. economy has has you know started to rebound pretty significantly as we've had uh, you know vaccinations I mean now I think you know more than four million people a day are being vaccinated in the United States and so. Um, the response to, uh, from of economic actors is sort of, you know, people are ready to go out and spend. There's a lot less uncertainty. We're at a very different stage in the pandemic than we were before. That's not to say that there aren't still risks and a certain level of uncertainty, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a very different situation. And so to me, I mean, my, from my perspective, you know, the value in, in you know, an infrastructure package uh, is, is for infrastructure itself, uh, not to, uh, you know, as an attempt to sort of stimulate coming out of COVID, uh, which was, you know, theoretically also the goal of the of the COVID relief package that passed recently. So, um, you know, that's kind of the summary of the, the the politics going on. I think right now around this this next next package. And I guess Jonathan, if we could have gone back to earlier in the pandemic, um, I think these funds would have been much more better used. You know, or at least part of them could have been used earlier on when people are really struggling. And as you said, you know, when you look at the markets, uh, I was saying earlier, you know, in in Canada. They're soaring. They're they're hitting new records, uh, and we're not even as far in the vaccine per capita. I think we're around fifteen percent, so we're significantly behind mm-hmm. where you guys are. Um, but right. even then, you're right. There there's a pent up demand, um, and I guess part of this is there's such a divide between those of us who have been working and just been putting money in the bank with less expenses, and those of us who have not. And it's sort of a bigger societal issue. But I don't even know if it's one government can really fix. Well, see, that's just it. You know, I think you hit the nail on the head. The there, one of the topics that I think people haven't been discussing to the degree that they should is how we deal with these kinds of emergencies in in the future. You know, to some degree, what we've seen with the pandemic is not unique, right? We've we've faced national security emergencies. We have faced you know natural disasters, whether hurricanes or, or floods or what have you. 
And, you know, the response is often the same. You know, let's, let's mobilize sort of an, an off-budget governmental package to kind of deal with these with these issues as quickly as we can. But, you know, government isn't really suited to doing that kind of rapid response. And so I think that the, the thing that it would be, uh, you know, as we, as we come out of the pandemic and we start to think about what policy should look like in the future, I think that we really need policymakers and, and you know, just thinkers on these topics to, to figure out and, and and think more about um, just how we how we're going to deal with these emergencies and how we can better prepare for them so that when they arise, we're not in this situation that just involves throwing money at the problem and hoping that something sticks. And, you know, that's not to say, of course, that in the context of the pandemic that there wasn't a federal role or that, you know, a, a lot of the action that was taken wasn't wasn't warranted. But, you know, I would argue that there are probably ways of doing that in a more cost effective way, first of all. And second of all, having people be better prepared so that they don't have to go and face these really substantial harms uh, when these when these things come up, and I, you know my my hope is that you know there there are perhaps lessons from other countries, there are lessons from uh, from within the states in the United States that um, that yeah, could be valuable. But I think you know what we've dealt with over the last year is um, is is a bigger issue than just even the pandemic itself. Blah Bakani, in conversation with Jonathan Bidlack, he is the a director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. You know, just just for the sake of argument, Jonathan, one of the things people will throw out is a basic income. And, you know, I, I know that's a big blanket term, but at least mm-hmm. that would be targeted and it would be sustainable beyond the pandemic. And we know that if you do a program like that, people aren't going to save that money. They're going to spend it. So does that mm-hmm. appeal to you as a better option than what we're seeing now? You know, it's a really interesting idea, and it's one that I've I've started to think more about. Um, you know, I, I think th- there are a couple things to say. I mean, one is that you know, in the United States, we have sort of a um, a melange of different different programs that cost a lot of money, and so I think the first question is how you would fit something like that in, given the existing programs that we already have. I think that you know, I actually think that on the, on the Republican side of the aisle, you probably get, could get support for that idea if if it were you know done in such a way that that you know maybe was revenue neutral or, or replace some existing programs that are that are perhaps less efficient or, or less needed. Um, you know, beyond that, I mean, I think there is a case to be made that. It, 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 so I think I think you're right that I, you know I, I I certainly don't want to assume that you know everyone would necessarily be be socking that away. But I do mm-hmm. think that you know when you look at private charities, for example, there's a lot of evidence that you know the ones that are the most effective are those that give people cash, um, and it's because uh, you know to some degree it's the most libertarian solution. And that you allow people to decide for themselves how best to apply those funds to their own needs. And so if there are things more important than saving at the moment, you know, whether it's rent or food or something like that, then then it certainly makes sense to go and to go and, you know, use those funds for that purpose. Um, you know, so uh, but of course, it's not it's not a perfect solution. There's limited evidence, you know, where it's been tried. Um, I think there is a case to be made, even from a from a fiscal standpoint, that, you know, perhaps if there was a universal basic income, we wouldn't have had the rush to have all of these additional, you know, federal packages, and it could have actually even come out to be, you know, perhaps more more fiscally sustainable um, uh, in this kind of situation. So I think it's one of those ideas that is untried. That's not to say that uh, it shouldn't be tried. I think it just needs to be investigated further. Jonathan, we only have a minute or so here. So really quickly, I think part of the issue here is, you know, when you look at what the GOP did under Trump, you still didn't really get the right policy. And I think part of the issue with U.S. politics is it's so polarized now, there is no happy middle. Everything is one extreme or another. I, I think that's I think that's exactly right. I think that American voters are polarized, and as a result, our elected officials are polarized. And I think that you know too often people are viewing these policy discussions through the lens of politics rather than the lens of what is right. Uh, and that goes for both sides, uh, you know. But but I think I think you're right that uh, that there's perhaps even more more hypocrisy on the on the Republican side. You know, just seeing some of the opposition that uh, wasn't in opposition, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when when the last president was in power. But uh, it's definitely an issue. It's definitely something that we that we need to work on as a country, I think. Jonathan, thank you again for your time. A very important issue, and I still can't really wrap my head around it, so I apologize if I was abstract, but that's a lot of money. Thank you for your time this morning. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Jonathan Bidlack, he is a director of the governance program at the R Street Institute, and we